<coughs> okay, so we're gonna go. So we're doing continuous random variables and normal probability. Remember, you guys, next week is the fun time of quiz time. And it's my easiest week, your guys is not. Um, once again, you know the restrictions, same thing. I get to basically hide out in the back of the class and watch you guys. That's the easiest thing. So I'm still in the back row. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But what you could do, okay, so if you do, you run into that, which is a legitimate concern, the best way to handle that is to copy it and take it somewhere else. Copy the question, take it somewhere else, and then if you change the numbers around, because statistics is all whole numbers, you're doing like two-way contingency tables. Just change the numbers, find new problems, or even look some up and just run the, the math. That's the easiest way to do it. But understand the concept, and honestly, and I will get it done, I swear I'll get it done, um, spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are your friend. Have it coded to all your answers. I will get around to that. Swear. Yes. Nope. It's Tuesday, Thursday. Yeah. Yep. So it's it's in class. It's not online. We're not doing that again. Uh, we're actually literally right on schedule somehow. I, considering how hectic this semester has been, I don't know how, but we are. Um, so I would have just been able to do like a live coding for stuff if I would have had time, but I don't. So we're doing normal probability. Yay. Everyone's favorites. So we're going to look at <coughs> probability dis distributions and density functions. Uh, basically the same thing we did last time, but with discrete random numbers and prob and normal probability. So. Normal probability is generally what we like having when we do statistics, because this is what, <coughs> sorry, I've been talking all day, so my throat's really bad. What we expect to see and everything. Like if you were to take, let's go back to freshman year, right? Freshman year when you have, ever, before people have flunked out, because everyone knows that happens even though you're not supposed to, right? You have a lot of people who barely make it in, a lot of people who are gonna succeed, but a vast majority of your people are going to be in the middle. We'll talk about that in a second. That is something that's called a normally distributed population. You have people who know a lot. You have people who know a, a large amount of people who know just enough, and then you have some people who don't know anything else. Uh, the easiest way to take to do this is kind of difficult because I almost guarantee you, 90% of you guys in your freshman year had probably taken calculus in high school. Think of the normal class. How many people have taken calculus? I mean, in a normal average class, how many people do you think have taken the calculus? Like five, 10%, right? So, and I'll talk about this later. What we are doing as we go later and later, and this is why it always bothers me when people grade on the curve. Are you representative of the typical freshman class, even for engineers? Or have we selected each time for a new population? We cannot assume the same things we had at the beginning as to now. So if you grade on a curve, you're going to disproportionately hurt the people at the end, even though they succeeded, because they're at the end of something that was selected very high for. So my mini rant and the white bugs me. And that's why I never really I graded on a curve, but I graded really super hard. And that's a way to correct for that. <clears throat> and there's a lot of math that goes into this. I'll probably talk about um, how you take non-normal and make it normal a bit in this. Uh, what we're going to do, uh, approximate probabilities for binomial Poisson. Yes, yes. Everyone loves Poisson and binomial, right? <clears throat> so this is where we actually hit calculus, finally, after like, you know, is for continuous var random variable x, the probability density function is a function such as your f of x is greater than zero, 
And from negative infinity to infinity, your f of x derivative of x is going to be equal to one, which kind of makes sense. It basically says, I forgot my that my derivative will be between zero and one, but we're talking about probability. It's not a big surprise. And when we look at the probabilities from A to B, uh, on the from A to B, the f of x, the derivative of f of x comes, or f of x times derivative of x is equal to the area under f of x from A to B. This is kind of where I was doing that business calc and it kind of was really trippy because I had to do this proof. <clears throat> when you take that derivative, you literally, as you go up, you can literally see your values go up. So you hit roughly the mid, the 50%, and then go back down. <clears throat> and here's this wonderful part. So if X is, capital X is a continuous random variable for any X of one and X of two, the probability from X of one to X of two is equal to probability from X of one to X to X of two. What is this? Oh, it doesn't matter if it's greater than, less than, or equal to, or greater than, or equal to, less than, or equal to, or both. It will be the same. Uh, everybody plug me. Continue. Let me see what's happened real quick here. Yeah, so, so once again, they love like these electrical current ones. So if you have a variable X, which is your current, and you measure it in a thin copper wire with milliamps. If your range of X values is between 4.9 to 5.1, so you have a variance of essentially 0.1, <coughs> and the probability density function is at five, what is the probability of the current less than 0.5 milliamps? So you take the derivative of 4.9 to 5, f of x, d of x. So that ends up 5 in the derivative of x, which gives you 0.5. Um, if you change it to uh, 4.95 to 5.1, you change it from that, it will end up being 0.75. You are essentially just looking for the area under the curve of the derivatives. That's all you're doing. Um, so this is of less than five, so 4.9 to five. This one you're going from 4.95 to 5.1. So, uh, this is, you know, the cumulative distribution function, kind of the same thing. The probability of big X is less than or equal to little x is equal to from negative infinity to X value, the F of U times derivative of U. Uh, and this is for all real numbers. So this is a uh, continuous, remember, because you don't have the contiguous, or this part right here. <coughs> those weird things and once again you could get down and you could do all this but as always there is always a good gd shortcut which we're going to talk about um because people who get paid a lot more than me and you combined have you know in microsoft put this in as a excel function because we have known values, known tables, because somebody's gone through and looked at all the possible variations and can calculate it. So, so the same copper wire, the cumulative distribution function of the random variable X consists of three expressions. Uh, if it's less than 4.9, if, uh, if, if X is less than 4.9 and the F of X is equal to zero, then, the derivative of that would be equal to uh, do, 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 do 5x minus 24.5 here for 4.9 to 5.1. 
and then from flip then from right here you have f of u d of u is equal to one for 5.1 and above uh, therefore you have a probability of zero less than 4.9 uh, for 5x minus 24, 5 between 4, 9, and 5, 1. And at 1, you have it's, or it's a probability of 1 and greater than 5.1. So you have essentially a rise from here to here given by the formula 5, uh, uh, linear formula 5x minus 24.5. So it's a way that we can essentially, once again, you taking this, it's slope of the derivative right here is what we're looking at. So if we have a continuous random variable and we can determine that from the cumulative distribution function, by taking, so the f of x would be equal to the derivative of f of x of the derivative of x. Uh, as long as, you know, once again, you're not dividing by zero and destroying the universe. <clears throat> so the derivative d of f of x is equal, uh, over the f, uh, the d of x is equal to your f of x. Also note that you have a different f of x, so it's capital f of x and not this f of x. Um, so make sure you watch your letters or things like that. And you get upset and you don't know why and you scream and yell at your homework and it doesn't work. Let's not do that, please. Don't relive my life. <coughs> so the reason we kind of do this is stuff like this. I'm, this is actually theoretically stuff that I could use if I wanted to be really mean to my middle school students, but I don't. Uh, so we're going, if you're doing a chemical reaction and you're trying to figure out in milliseconds the amount of time it takes and you know general rates of reaction, you can kind of calculate it. So for this, the f of x of zero, when you have values less than x, if your reaction hasn't started, your reaction rate is zero, right? Makes sense. Once your reaction starts going, you, you use one minus uh, Euler's to the negative 0 0.01 X. So you're starting to count down, or you count up actually your reaction time. <clears throat> so to create the density function, you take the D of F of X over the D of X. So uh, uh, the D of D of X of zero, that's right. Uh, that's the same as that. You take the derivative of this, you end up with, 0 0.01 e to the negative 0 point, uh, 0 0.01 x because I love you. Uh, it's the only logs or uh, derivatives I've ever loved with Euler's because I don't have to actually do anything. Um, so use the same function. You just take the derivative of all parts of it. You end up with this value for values greater than zero. And the probability of reaction completes in 200 milliseconds. You just take this and plug in 200 to it, plug it through it, and you get your probability. Uh, so whenever you actually do this and you run your probability, whenever you have the question, you just plug it into the derivatives and find your, where you are along that curve. So usually what ends up happening, I don't have this, is from zero to one, you're basically running up like that. So at this point, actually it would be about 200, sorry. And of course, I left my mouse at work. So at this intersection right here, 
you're about 0.86. And remember, at this point, this number will always be positive because you cannot have a negative number for your probability. Ugh, track pads, they love me so. So how we find the mean and variance of this continuous random variable. <clears throat> so you find the mean by, uh, by taking the x of f of x of the derivative of x. So we have kind of the same basic functions. Uh, do not want the highlighter, I want the laser pointer, there we go. So instead of running the f of x of the d of x, we put in our expected value there of x. <clears throat> when we do the variance, once again, the same thing we kind of did the last time, we're looking for the difference between your x and your mean for all your values. Uh, so when you actually end up running it through, you end up with x squared, f of x, d of x minus the uh, mu two, the mean squared. And then to find your standard deviation, once again, the easiest thing, and if you learn nothing else from this course, take the square root of the variance. So all of these are essentially just ways that we can express um, these random variables in mathematical terms. It's, it's a way that we have noticed that math works along with what naturally occurs. Uh, it's one of those weird things that was noted because originally we just kind of started looking at numbers and statistics is kind of modernish for math. to do, do so after this. <clears throat> so an example, uh, for the car, uh, copper current measured in 4.1, the mean of x is equal to the x of f of x of d of x. So 5x squared over 2 from 4.9 to 5.1 would be equal to 5. And then you take your x minus your 5 squared, f of x d of x, is 5x minus 5 cubed over 3 uh, from 4.9 to 5.1 would give us 0 0.0033. Take the square root of that, and that's what. Because they oddly enough, they'll give us a square root. I don't know why. Really, Android? 0.57. So the standard deviation for this zero point five seven. Which is just the square root of that. Wait, I did the wrong one. I have zero zero. So it's a zero five seven. Hmm. At least I caught it. So the square standard deviation is zero point zero five seven. <coughs> So whenever we're trying to find an expected value, uh, we end up doing much the same. So we have uh, the h of x in this case, uh, from, no, sorry, from negative infinity to infinity, of course, of an expected value of h of x. Uh, it's from negative infinity to infinity of h of x times f of x times derivative of x. So we have an example here where you have current measured in milliamps. And we have an expected power when the resistance is 100 ohms 
Um, so what, is, what do we expect when we have 100 ohms? So that is our H of X right there. We know what we're looking for at that point. Um, so we use the results of the power of watts of P is equal to 10 minus 6 Ri squared, where I is the current in milliamps and R is resistance in ohms. So it gives us this formula for H of X of 10 to the negative 6, 100 X squared. <coughs> Put it into here, we have 10 to the negative fourth from 4.9 to 5.1 of 5x squared d of x, which gives us, uh, rationalize that, uh, x to the cubed over 3 from 4.9 to 5.1, and that's equal to 0 0.0025 watts. And no, I don't personally expect you to do the calculus on this. Because I think most of these, if you actually wanted to, you can actually just code your computers to do it for you. If I'm not mistaken. Can you actually store variables in, in MATLAB or functions? And is there anything against, did I say there's anything against making that function right before class? No, I didn't. You want to do that? If you want to spend the time to code it to do it right for expected values and all that, go for it. It's 100% up to you because usually if you can spend the time to code a computer to do the math for you, you know the formula more and you just got annoyed with doing the math and I'm okay with that. It helps you, it helps you memorize it. What? Did I, um, no, I didn't say that. If you want to use Python for it, don't use other people's, you create them yourself. But yes, because I do know that trick too. If you want to create anything in any language that you are currently using, as long as you don't steal it blatantly from other people, go for it. And I know Python is really good at drawing from other people, so is R. <coughs> code it yourself. Uh, if you have any questions, you can just show me your code and I'll give you the green light and then go. Because you'll learn more from coding than you would from having to be forced to do the math. Man, I hate this prime now. So if you have a continuous random variable x with probability density function, uh, the f of x from 1 over b minus a is how we do it. So that is a continuous random variable. Basically sets our boundaries between these two. So the f of x of 1 on this b over a is from here to there. So to find, so this is for that, once again, for that uniform distribution, the flat top like this. Uniform distributions tend to be the easiest to do uh, math-wise just because it makes sense. You're looking at things over a range of periods, so it's all going to be nice and even, so the math is easy. So if we're looking for the mean and variance, the mean is just the average of your two ends. Makes sense, right? A plus B over two. And the variance is uh, essentially you split the difference and square it and you put it over 12. <coughs> Why 12? I'm not sure. I'm sure there's a good reason somewhere, but 12. I, should, I, don't think it's, I might Google that in a bit. I'm not entirely sure, or someone will look it up and tell me. I don't really know. Either way. Uh, so the mean of a continuous uniform random variable x is equal to from a to b, x over b minus a, d of x, which is equal to 0.5 x squared uh, over the difference between b and a uh, from a to b, which is equal to a plus b over 2. Yay, proof. And the variance from a to b of x minus a plus b over 2, all that quantity squared over b minus a, d of x is equal to x minus a plus b over 2, all that cubed over 3, b minus a from a to b, which is equal to b minus a squared over 12. So that's how they get it. I don't actually have to look it up. But once again, 
someone's done the calculus, you don't have to. You could just use the nice simplified formulas. Because this is not a proofs class, this is not a theoretical class, this is applied. We care about the applied. So if you have a uniform current, which kind of pseudo makes sense, imagine that. Uh, and a random variable X has a continuous uniform distribution from the ranges of 4.9 to 5.1. Uh, they like to do really small distributions for some reason. Makes sense if for engineers, makes absolutely no sense for my field, but whatever. <coughs> the probability density function of X is F of X is equal to five uh, between 4.9 and 5.1 was the probability that a measurement of current is between those 4.95 and five. So the probability between 4.95 and five is equal to between 4.95 and five of F of X, D of X, which is equal to five times 0 0.05 uh, equals 2.25. <coughs> so the mean and variance can be applied with A is equal to 4.9 and 5.1. That's easy enough, these two five plus one. You just take the difference and add the difference. So our mean, uh, 4.9 and 5.1, add them together, is 10 divided by two is five. The variance, we have the difference of that is 0.2 squared over 12 would give us that 0 0.0033. So those, quite honestly, just take them and you plug them in. Once again, the, the uniform distribution would be really easy to plug, to code in. And then you just A, B. Um, if you want to deal with functions, this is a perfect time to deal with functions because you can just make a function for your uh, uniform and call it and go. I don't know. I have never really gotten to MATLAB and the functions of it. I assume it's relatively straightforward. It's a script, pseudo scripting, right? So you should be able to create functions and call them if they're not already there. Are they there? Anybody played around with it? Do they have the the script, the uh, functions for uniform distribution in MATLAB? Because oh, if they have it, then you can just call the function. If not, you have to make it. But even then, it's not a hard function to write. Uh, so for normal distribution, this is kind of what, like I said, everything kind of lives in. <coughs> so the random variable x with a probability density function of f of x is one over the square root of two pi sigma uh, e to the negative parentheses x minus mu quantity squared over two sigma squared from negative infinity. Confused yet? This is your normal distribution. This is unfortunately the math we live in. Um, In this, our normal random variables from negative infinity to infinity will be your expected value of x is going to be your mean, and your variance of x is going to be your variance. <coughs> and your no whenever you do this, remember you're looking at populations and you're not looking at samples. You're using a capital N. Uh, because, and this goes into this, has anybody heard of the central limit theorem? So, assuming I take a, the idea of the central limit theorem, I don't know if it goes into it, but I'm going to go into it, because this bugs the living daylight out. Because, yeah, assuming a, a large enough population, so I think it's like 20 plus people, and assuming that I can sample more from my population, I can assume my data should be considered normal, no matter what. That is the central limit theorem. Does anybody have issues with that? Because what happens if it's not? What's the number one thing that people are going to do? It's like, oh, I can use central limit theorem. I got 20 people in my class. I can assume it to be normal. I can drop on a larger population of my class. Okay. Uh, if I'm, if, even if I'm counting my population as engineering students, is there a difference between a junior and senior engineering student and a freshman engineering student? How big is that difference? 
a lot, a lot because those those four math classes, like Diffie Q, you're already like, I have to take that again. Ah! Diffie Q, the ultimate equalizer for everyone. Um, you those classes make a difference. So you can't compare one population to the other. So you have to be very, very careful when you use this. Because can you actually get a bigger sample size? Yes, you can say you can. Is it actually available? If you work in a production line, yeah. Within reason, you could probably pull more samples. Because you know the boss is gonna say, well, the boss might say no. Might as well say that's what you can pull. Or they could say you get enough to do whatever you need to do so that I don't have to do blah. It's up to you. It's up to what your circumstances are. <clears throat> but the idea is if I get more things because they're doing that law of large numbers, I should get something close to normal and I should do something that follows this guy. Anybody seen this? Yeah, I had I used I love the homework for this. At least I, I really despise actually explaining the homework for this because you either will get this like that or it's going to be kind of a weird struggle. So from your mean, you can estimate how much of a population is there based on your standard deviation. So in this inside part is one standard deviation from the mean. So you would have that 68% from here to here. And if you bisect that, which you do, each of those would be 34%. From two standard deviations, you have 95%. So once again, 45, uh, so that's 12% or 11% on each side. And three standard deviations, you're at 99.7 or, um, so that's 45 point, I don't know that one. I got into decimals. I've been running all day. I don't remember that last one. So 99.7 divided by 2 minus 34 minus 11, 4.85. So there will be random questions that if you know this, you can answer without trying. You, I have been able to do, this is a scary thing. Uh, anybody ever actually heard of the T-test and Z-test and stuff like that? Yes, I could do T-test and Z-test in my head using standard deviation without actually doing any of the math. Because of this. I could do the two standard deviations from any known mean and see if the other, either the test mean or the other deviation will overlap because I know this. Once again, like I said before, slightly autistic, that's why I could do stuff like that. Because I noticed that, and like, that's easier than doing all the math to me, because it's visual. Don't expect you guys to do that. Never would expect anybody but me and my weirdness to do that. Um, but knowing these numbers can save you a lot of hassle. <clears throat> knowing these numbers, when you're working, saves you even more hassle because you know where to expect to find things. You know your bread and butter of everything you do, assuming that you have things that go the way they're supposed to, will be in this middle, that middle 68%. I mean, if you tell me I'm gonna have a 68% chance of being within like, like if you're talking like 0.1 standard deviation, if you tell me I'm gonna have almost 70% within 0.1 of a number, I'm probably gonna take it, just because that's my level. Um, so when you're dealing with like uh, engineering processes, the mean is not necessarily what you want to deal with, but the standard deviation is what you want. You want your machines to be very, very precise because if you can narrow that standard deviation, you're going to be a lot more accurate in what you're dealing with. So that's the important thing is realizing that standard deviation. And like, I, like I've done it before, did I do this? Yeah, I did this with you. Being able to say, how wide your standard deviation is more important to a lot of people than where your mean is. Uh, that, you know that, that derivative there? there are, those are the known values from that derivative. 
And once you know those numbers, you'll never do the derivative again, because I've actually had to prove it for someone on a, on a tutoring session. Sure, sure not fun. Because, uh, yeah, you remember that formula, right? That, I drive that. Yeah, don't want to do that, do you? No, no, you don't. No one does. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, that was obviously a private tutoring session because nobody at PC hits that. <laughs> um, so those were those numbers come from. Essentially, you just end up using the empirical rule because it's easier than just plotting the numbers down. <clears throat> uh, but that is essentially how I use it to kind of pseudo get around some of the numbers. And it works the same because if you're talking to another statistician, they know these numbers because they use them a lot. Uh, so I could tell you the difference and the percent, like for instance, I could tell you a little bit of basic math, how much will be this side, how much will be this area, because it's just adding and subtracting from one. So for a standard, normal, random variable in a normal distribution, your mean is going to be zero. And your standard or your variance, sorry, is going to be one and standard deviation. <coughs> so this is your standard normal random variable and it's a Z. So this is what is called your Z score. This is how we do it. We take all the numbers from various other forms and turn it into like a unitless comparison of others called a Z score. <coughs> The Z score goes. Mm, it, I know it's supposed to go for infinity. In all reality, it goes from uh, plus and minus like 3.5 ish. Anything more than that, you get into the point of why. You could technically go higher, technically go lower, but it takes such random outliers that it's not worth it. Uh, the normal cutoff for being significant is like 1.65 to 1.96, which once again, autistic, don't memorize those numbers. Uh, so there is probability cumulative functions that you could use. Please use them because You don't really want to go up and look for the 32.5%. You want to just put it into a computer and get the answer. Or there's tables. That's kind of where I did at the beginning, which was so much fun. Back in my day, walked uphill twice. So, like I just said, if we have a normal random variable right here, we can find the area. Based on the z-score, oh, I just realized I have the hand and not the laser pointer. We could find the area based on the z-score to the left of it. <clears throat> so when you find area to the left of it, what you're doing is finding the values less than that particular point. So we would go, so we have a few table where we would go and look at this value. So on a z-table, if you've never looked at them, they can be kind of sort of weirdly confusing. You have the first two digits of the Z table and the very first column. So you go down to the first value, 1.5. And then as you go up down the very first row, yes, you find the last digit, which is at this point zero. So you go 1.50 and you go to that value. And just a cross table. So 0.93319 is my percentile. And at this point, it's most usually obvious. I think to myself, where am I on the table? Am I looking at a higher percentage or a lower percentage? And that's from there, I make my decision to add or subtract. Or subtract. So where am I at that number or that number? It's obvious in cases like this, but when you're like 0.4, or when they do those weird tricky questions where they ask you for the center or the outside part, you have to think critically, what area am I looking at and what should I be doing to find? Because this is nice and easy. You know, the homeworks, once you get there, will not be. Um, yes, sorry. 
zero is mean. So back here, the mean is zero. Because the z-score has nothing to do with values. Zero is your state of normality. That's the very center of your distribution. And then how far away from that mean we're going from usually about negative two to two. And that is just a number that expresses how far away from the middle of the data we are. It's nothing to do with directly with, I mean, it does have something to do with your values, but not directly. It's something that's not in a formula. It's like X minus mean quantity squared over your standard deviation, I think. It's been a while since I've looked at it. Something like that. There's a specific formula for your Z score. Not overly difficult. We're just trying to explain what you're doing as you're going up and down your x axis to calculate how far away you are from your mean and express how much of your distribution is left or right at that point. I don't even know why it says find answer, find answer. So if it's, oh, my guess is what it's asking for is the area to the left and the area to the right. So the area to the left is that. 0.933 three here. And my area to the right would be 1 minus 0 0.933. I need to remember to take my mouse next time, which would be 0 0.0664. Eight one zero six six eight one. I cannot draw with a mouse pad. You know, I'm going to leave that. It's kind of clear. I don't want to take up time with me badly drawing. So that's what we're doing is we're trying to calculate generally the area this way and the area this way. So Okay, it was right next. The Z score is calculated by your X value, minus your mean, and your deviation, or your uh, sigma. <coughs> so when you have that expected value of zero, minus zero over one, we get a Z score of zero. As you go up and down, you go less and less away. And that standard deviation, your in and out, will affect the difference of the mean, because that's what you divide it by which is the next one. So yeah, that's one. Once again, you'll probably have to calculate way too much. So if you have the measurement of a strip wire, we assume to follow normal distribution, uh, yay assumptions, with a mean of 10 and a, Sigma squared of four uh, milliamps. What is the probability the measures exceeds 13 milliamps? <coughs> so here's our distribution. Uh, this one, and so we have the current milliamps. So what we do is essentially we find the z score. That's what we're looking for. We know the mean is 10, and we're looking for a value of 13. So 13 minus 10 is two is three divided by 10.3. What they did. So you would go take 0.3. Wait. Wait. What did it do? Seeds 13 million. The 13 million. Wait. What did they do here? What? I'm talking about the. I, yeah, I haven't figured that one out yet. That's probably you let x equal to. Why did they do it by? Yeah, I know. Oh, I forgot to take the square root. So 13 minus 10 is 3. Square root of 4 is 2. So that gives us 3 over 2, which is 1.5. So we have a z score of 1.5. So they uh, they did a really bad job because the z of 1.5 would be right about here. Uh, so yeah. So then we go back, we get the same value we got before, which is that 0.93319. 
So if we're looking for the probability that it exceeds it, and we know that our expected value, the value we're looking at is greater than the mean, then what we know is that the chances of it exceeding it is not gonna be very good. So that's the first thing I do when I look at these problems because I wanna make sure I get the right answer. If I know the probability is not good that it's going to exceed, then I'm gonna go ahead and assume that probability is going to be a small number. So when I see a 0.93319, I know I'm gonna find the reciprocal. I just take one minus that number, not the reciprocal, the remainder of it. So one minus that number would give us a 0.7. So about 7% chance that the current would exceed 13 milliamps. Uh, so suppose we have X and it's a normal random variable with a mean and variance uh, given, then the probability of big X is less than or equal to little x is equal to the probability of your standard or your z-score of your big X is going to be less than the z-score of your little x. So they just plugged them both in to that z-score. So kind of makes sense. Uh, so when z is the standard normal random variable and little z is x minus mu over sigma and a z a value obtained by standardizing x, the probability is obtained by a wonderful table three or a z-table. You can just Google it. Um, if you want to do it by hand and you want to use a z-table, you can print it out paper too. I don't really care. If you want to do it pen and paper, go for it. Let me deal with this. So what is, uh, continuing in the previous example, what is the probability that a measurement is going to be between nine and 11 milliamps? So we find the probability of nine, the probability of 11, and you find the middle part of it. So nine minus 10 over two is uh, negative one half, <clears throat> and 11 minus 10 over two is positive one half. So then we go onto the Z table and we take the probability to the right minus the probability to the left, so 0.5 minus negative 0.5, and find the middle. So that's 0.69 minus 0.308 gives us about 38.29. Now, another way to look at this is remember that normal probability, the all the way back here. Right? A standard deviation of one would mean that I am pulling one or your value that is, let's say, given this example. So we have a standard deviation of two. So if we have a standard deviation of two and we have a test value of 12 minus 10 over two, that gives us a z score of one. And if you have a z-score of negative one and one, look it up, it would be 68. That's where we get those numbers. That z-table, which is derived from that wonderful differentiation, we can take those and normalize them into known values. The more you use those known values, the more you have those points of reference because they're easy points of reference, the more likely you are to understand where you are on the distribution. Uh, so in this one, uh, what is the value for the pro probability that a current measures 0.98? So this is the same thing, except we start with the probability. So what you would do on this case is you go and on the table, if you use it or using a computer or Google, I can Google this answer, find the z-score associated with 0.98. Uh, once you have that value, 2.06, you plug that into the equation and then you solve it because you're looking for that x value. So you have the mean x value and the standard deviation. So you take this times 2, um, 0.98 times 2, so 
2. Yeah, so they did it down here. 2.26 times 2 plus 10. So they just rewrote the formula. Gives you 14.1 million. And then you could use previous examples if you're doing it off the same question type to see if it makes sense. Because we had one over here where we had 13 milliamps. Even though we're looking for less than, we saw the number here is 93%. Since the next one is slightly higher, we know that it's going to be a higher z-score, so we're going to have a higher value than the 1.5, so it kind of makes sense. So that's one of the ways that I use, like I hate to say it, simple logic to see if the numbers I'm getting out of the equation actually fit in with the logic of what I'm doing. So normal approximation. Ugh. So when you have very, very large numbers and you don't want to do a lot of it. So if you have a binomial random variable with a parameter of N and P, your Z score is going to be equal to uh, X minus NP over the square root NP quantity one minus P. So, <coughs> and that is roughly the standard normal random variable uh, to do it for a binomial probability. Uh, we, with a continuer, continuality correction, uh, you use the following function. So you have x plus 0.5 minus np. So instead of x minus np, you change it to x plus 0.05, and the rest of it's the same. And then you do it again for a negative 0.05. Oh, negative 0 0.5, yes. Uh, this is good for NP greater than five and N times the quantity one minus P greater than five. So, so. so when you deal with actual examples, so you have a digital communication problem is in 4.13. So we're looking between 150 and 150.5. So we have x minus 160 um, over the square root of 160 times 1 minus 10 to the fifth uh, is less than or equal to 150.5 minus 160 uh, square root of 160 minus 1 times 10 to the negative fifth. So the reason we do this and the reason we approximate it is because we don't want to do that much math. But this math is really close and close enough that we usually don't care. Um, generally, the only time we care is when this Z function is like within a hundredth of being significant. If it's something that close, then we're like, okay, we need to go and look at it a little bit closer, maybe do the annoying math if it's more useful than trying to slightly rerun it. Because if you're that close uh, to rejecting or not rejecting, then it might be worth looking at to see if you're okay or not. But most of the times you do not. Oh. When you're dealing with Poisson distribution, uh, X minus lambda over the square root of lambda is what you do for expected values for Z. So your expected value is lambda, your variance is lambda, so our z-score is x minus lambda over the square root of lambda. Uh, we use this when you have a lambda that is greater than 5. So if we have a normal number of asbestos particles in a square meter of dust on the surface, and it follows a Poisson distribution, it kind of makes sense. I, I wish I would have thought about this before. It kind of makes sense. Anybody ever deal with asbestos? It's not much fun. So uh, my greenhouse for my undergrad was like an asbestos filled nightmare. Like all the pipes were wrapped in it. The benches were made out of it. Like you don't want to go there. Especially when it's disturbed. So if you've ever dealt with it, asbestos is only dangerous when it's in particle form in the air. So most of the time you will not have any asbestos, but until you have a disturbance and then you have a lot in a short area and then it kind of fillows out. That's a Poisson distribution, so it kind of makes sense. <clears throat> so the number of particles in a square meter of dust on the surface follows the distribution with a mean of 1,000. 
which is our X here, and a square meter of dust is analyzed and found the probability that 950 or fewer. So we have 950.5 minus 1,000, and since the lambda, which is our mean, is the same as our standard deviation, we take the square root of 1,000, which gives us a probability of Z less than or equal to negative 1.57, <clears throat> when you have a probability of negative 1.57, you have a very low one. So it's at a negative or at a 0.058, so a 5.8% chance of having fewer than 950 uh, particles in a square meter. For exponential distributions, so exponential distributions are when you have the exponential factor. Uh, a random variable x is equal to the distance between two events from a Poisson process with a mean events of lambda greater than zero. It's called, that's the exponential random. So lambda e uh, Euler's to the negative lambda x for values between zero and infinity. So once again, you can't have negative x values for a Poisson distribution because you can't have negative events. So our mean is one over lambda. And our variance is one over lambda squared. So this is slightly different than what we had for the Poisson distribution. We take the inverse, one over lambda, one over lambda squared. And we can't find the standard, well, we can find the standard deviation. It's just, actually you can't, can you? One over square root. I guess it'd be square root of, or square root of lambda or lambda over. Oh, I'd have to do the math, and my brain is not working right now enough to do it in my head. So take. So, if you have a large computer network, you calculate. You look at logons from systems can be modeled using a Poisson distribution. Also makes sense, you know, when you have when do most people log into a computer at work about eight o'clock in the morning. Folks, that's when you get into work. So that's when you have all your login activity. So when should your servers be starting to, to prep for that payload? About 7:55 ish. This will tell you when you should. So you have a mean of 25 logons per hour. What is the probability that there are no logons for the next six minutes or 0.1 of hours? So probability of x is greater than 0.1 from 0.1 to infinity, 25e e to the negative 25x, d of x, so e to the negative 25 times 0.1 or 8.2%. Which kind of makes sense. 8.2% is not that big, but we're looking at no logons within six minutes. And we're averaging 25 per hour. So uh, when we look at this, if we're looking at between two and three minutes, we can calculate that as 0.33 to 0.5. So when we do the derivative, it's 0.33 to 0.5 of the formula, which gives us a value of 15.2%. Or you could just plug in each value for this. So you can either do it by the calculus or the algebra. It honestly doesn't make a difference. Whichever one annoys you the less, take it and run. Uh, I always found that it's easier to program computers to run algebra than calculus. So. Uh, so the time interval from such time there's probability of no logins occur during the interval of 0.9. So once again, we have our n probability here. We're looking for an x value that meets this form. So negative 25 x is equal to the natural log of 90. Uh, running the math, negative uh, 0.10536 over negative 25 gives us 0.00. 41 hours or about 15 seconds. So we have a 15 seconds of not having a log on 90% of the time. <clears throat> and the mean incident deviation is you just take that 25 and put one over 25. 
for both of them. The standard deviation should be squared. They, did they not square it on here? They did not square it. So that would be standard deviation of one over 25 squared and not one over 25. They actually have it wrong. I don't know if they are the first one's right or the second one's right. Uh, I can check real quick. I would think so. Square root squared. Yeah, it would be. So that that is correct. Square root because that was the other one was a variance. You're correct. <coughs> so exponential problems are very uh, important for rational numbers. Um, so you turn around. So on this one, you have a ex uh, exponential random variable x. So probability x is less than t1 plus t2 and probability that x is greater than t1 is equal to the probability of x is less than t2. So right here you have t1 plus t2, this error, uh, t2, t1, t1, t2. So all this area right here, so the probability is x is less than t2. So this whole area is less than this under the curve. <coughs> So the probability, so this one is where you have a Geiger counter. Oh, Geiger counter. So assume X has an exponential distribution with an expected value of 1.4 minutes. What is the probability that we detect the particle within 30 seconds of starting the counter? Uh, pretty high, by the way. Or maybe not. So probability that X is less than 0.5. So we take the function at 0.5. So one minus Euler, so negative 0.5 over 1.4. Run that through and you get 30%. And then what is the probability something is detected in the next 30 seconds? Well, even though they ran through the whole numbers again, what do you think? If you have a 30% chance of getting a number in the first half a minute, is it really gonna change? Uh, but they did it. Three to three and a half. Uh, uh, over the probability of x is greater than 3. So <clears throat> function of 3.5 minus the function of 3 over 1 minus the function of 3 is equal to 0.35 or 0.117 or 0.3. So practical interpretation. Mm. Oh, this whole thing boiled down is to remind you that just because something does or doesn't occur doesn't change the probability that it's going to occur in the future. A Poisson distributions and these exponential distributions are very frustrating, uh, especially if you're in the field and you have to get data. Because your chances of an event occurring are the same no matter how long it's been since you've had an event occur. Eventually the numbers equal out. You could have an event happen 50 times in a row, and you shouldn't, or you can have an event not happen for days at times. Um, my poor, poor teacher for this uh, was a uh, bug teacher. He did entomology, and his grad students had to go out and get bug traps, and there were so many traps set for days on end that had nothing in them. But that follows Poisson distribution. He expects a lot during certain times and then nothing at any other time. So. Your probability events is independent of each other. Your probability will continue to be the same whether the event has occurred or not. Which makes sense. If you're having an electrical wire, you have a 10% chance of failure. It doesn't matter if you've not had a failure all day. Your chances are still 10%. <clears throat> Erlang and gamma distributions. Not gonna lie, never, I've used gamma once. I'll take that back. Erlang, I've never used. So the probability density function that defines an Erlang random variable is equal to lambda to the R times X to the R minus one times Euler to the negative lambda X. Values X greater than zero and R being a real positive number. Um, so an Erlang random variable with R equal one is an exponential random variable. So it's just a very specific type of density function. I'm sure someone spent way too much time and got yelled at way too much. Prove it. And I don't even know it. So I'm sorry, guys. Sorry, Erlang.
So, failures of CPUs. Annoying, right? Everyone loves them so much. Uh, so, these are follow Poisson distribution. Uh, assume that units are that fail are repaired immediately. <laughs> if I had the money, uh, and the mean number of failures per hour is 0 0.0001. So capital X denotes the time until four failures occur. Uh, one of the probabilities that X exceeds 40,000 hours. So how can you get 40,000 hours of life before you have four failures? <coughs> how long till your quad core dies? So the random variable capital N denotes the number of failures in 40,000 hours. The time until four failures occurs exceeds 40,000 hours if and only if the number of failures in 40,000 hours is less than or equal to 10. Basically, as long as three fail, you're good. Anything more, four and more, you're gone. So the probability of X is greater than 40,000 is equal to the probability of N less than or equal to three. So if we assume normal Poisson distribution, then expected N is equal to 40,000 times the probability, and that's going to be equal to four. So we expect to have that. Uh, so the probability of X greater than 40,000 is equal to the probability N less than or equal to three. So the summation from zero to three of E to the negative four times four to the K over K, uh, permeations gives us 0.433. So we have a 43% chance of having four cores die. Which, you know what, fair enough. At 40,000 hours, I'd take that. So more wonderful formulas. So the gamma function to divide uh, is given as the gamma of R from zero to infinity of x to the r minus 1, Euler's to the negative x dx. I think that's right. This is the values of r. Um, so the f of x is lambda r times x to the r minus 1, e to the negative lambda, lambda x over lambda, or sorry, gamma r. and positive R's for that one as well. So you can have a gamma distribution within an Erlang distribution. So I guess I have done an Erlang, I just didn't know it at the time. So our mean is gonna be equal to R over lambda and our variance is R over lambda squared. So it's the same thing we did with our Poisson, our exponential Poisson distribution, except you use an R on top instead of one. Which one? What, this, this little guy right here? Gamma. That's gamma, apparently. Capital one, yeah, I don't know. I don't understand why they use so much Greek symbols. I'm like, uh, I remember. I remember most of them, but uh, I assumed on that one, but it seems like capital gamma. When you're talking about gamma distribution. Okay. Kind of more of the variations on a theme. So the time to prepare, microarray. Uh, Okay, I've had to do this. These are annoying, by the way. Uh, for high output genomics is in a Poisson process. Yeah, it's kind of true. Um, anybody actually know what a microarray is? So imagine you put the same DNA on a huge tap slide, and then you expose different parts to different kind of environments, and you're looking at how genes express independently of each other. So you can see this area has, you know, is expressing to this. This is this one isn't, so you can see what areas of the gene express towards traits. Kind of a cool thing, kind of really weird to trip around and it uses a lot of colors. Uh, so what is the probability that 10 slides require more than 25 hours to prepare? Uh, depends on who's doing them. Uh, so let X denote the time to prepare 10 slides. Because of the assumption of a Poisson, 
x has a gamma distribution of lambda of one half and an r of 10 and the probability is x is greater than 25. so x is equal to 25 and then we have 10 slides so we're looking at less than 10. so the expected number is we have that 25 um, hours times one half so 12 and a half slides in 25 hours this is our expected number so probability n minus nine is the summation from zero to nine of Eulers to the negative 12.5 or expected number times 12.5 k to the k permeation or 20.14 so we have a 20 percent chance of being unable to do 25 slides or 10 slides in 25 hours yeah don't go into genomics Once again, you get these, you use a computer. I would actually use Excel for this one and just calculate it all out. Whenever I have permeations, I always tend to use Excel because it makes life easier. They can break it down from zero to nine, but that's me. A Weeble distribution <coughs> says you dot the gamma was fun. I don't remember these guys. Um, and then variable x with the probability density function of f of x is equal to times the quantity x over delta and quantity to the power of beta minus one uh, exponent. Yeah. So the cumulative density function of that is one minus Euler's number. Gamma, delta gamma, um, one over one plus beta, and the variance is. Let me move this. Gamma. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah. Delta one plus two over beta minus gamma squared open bracket gamma one plus one over beta squared all of this all of that squared. Ugh. Computers, computers. I hate to do, be a dead horse, but you end up having this in there. You end up changing your different variables, and it will model the That's what ends up happening. Um, yeah, this is intriguing, but it's up to you how you want to work towards this. I usually, like I said, I usually use for anything computers to end up modeling my distribution, modeling my variables and my expected values because it just gets very easy to make silly mistakes when you're doing this. So, because, and you can tell, because when they do these. And then you get the right? So use these to train your computer whenever way you have to get the right answer, because you'll have the right answer here. And then you can just change your variables to be what they are doing it. That's the takeaway I always got from these. So the time in, uh, to failure in hours of a bearing in a mechanical shaft to satisfactory model is a Weeble random variable with beta is one half and gamma is 5,000 hours. The mean time to failure, so 5,000 gamma one plus one half <coughs> equals 5,000 gamma 1.5. So we're looking at 5,000 times 0.5 times the times square root of pi or 4,431.1 hours. So what is the probability that you're gonna get 6,000 hours out of it? So probability greater than 6,000, one minus F of 6,000 is equal to the exponent of negative 6,000 over 5,000 quantity squared, or Euler's to the negative 1.44, or, or 0.237. So only 23.7% of all your ball bearings are gonna last 6,000 hours.
<coughs> so log normal. Uh, these are a little bit normal, a little bit better. <coughs> we're, we're getting there. I swear we're getting there. Uh, there oh, by the way, this is why there's an entire field of mathematics and how to get your distributions out of these distributions and into normal distributions. Uh, because these are not fun, and if you can transform them into normal distributions, you don't have to do this math. So, and there's like literally massive tests to test whether your distribution is normal or not to make to save your sanity. So we have a log normal distribution as a normal distribution with means uh, sigma variance of w squared. Then x is equal to the exponent of w. Uh, and that's called a log normal random variable with this wonderful density function. One over x to the w, what is it? What is that w sigma? Lambda, I don't know. Square root of two pi exponent uh, bracket negative natural log of x minus, I can never remember. I My brain is, what is it? Theta, theta squared two over lambda. Yeah, you can tell I'm not a mathematician, right? Uh, and this is from, once again, from zero to infinity, since we're dealing with positive numbers, because we can't really have a negative one down here, right? I do remember that much. <clears throat> so our mean invariance is e to the theta plus w squared over two. Sorry, mine is like incredibly small. And e to the 20 plus w squared, e to the Euler's to the w squared minus one. What, two theta? Is that two theta? Where's two theta? Is that 20 plus? Two? Is that two theta? Mine, mine is, you've seen like how PowerPoint like shrinks everything. It looks like 20. Like, then again, I'm I'm sorry for the guy, people in the back because if you try to look up here and see it, it's probably about the same. They never really think about size when they make these powerpoints. So, if you have semiconductors and it follows a log normal distribution with ten and one point five as your values. What's the probability that it's going to exceed 10,000? So once again, probability, plop it into here. Probability that x is greater than 10,000 <coughs> is equal to 1 minus probability exponent w is less than 10,000. So you plot that in. Uh, w is less than the natural log of 10,000. So natural log 10,000 minus 10 over 1.5 uh, iota, which would give you one minus 0 0.3 which is actually 0.39 or 70.1 percent and yes i know i normally quit but i'm literally on slide 40 out of 44. so if you uh was the lifetime exceed by 90.99 once again you do the same math you just i'm going to try yeah, you find your 0.99 of the z-score, go into the table, plug it in, and do the math in order to solve for that 0.99. Uh, same thing, the mean invariance of a lifetime. Take the same values and plug it in, take it out, you get it. But once again, I'm probably I'm trying to think, do I have time to do it this weekend? I'm going to try my best this weekend to get some get a couple of videos on how to do spreadsheets for these if you nobody's ever done them so that you can see how you could just take them make a simple spreadsheet plug in values and get your answers because i don't think you can use excel right i don't even know if i could you could use old sheets or not but and then the last one is a beta distribution so if you have a random variable x with a probability density function uh you have gamma times alpha plus beta over gamma alpha Times gamma beta times the quantity one minus x to the beta minus one for x in zero to one. 
So in order to do these, you do have to have positive alpha and beta values. So the mean of this value is alpha over alpha plus beta. And the variance is alpha times beta over alpha plus beta quantity squared plus alpha plus beta plus one. And the weird thing about the beta distribution is it's the only one you can directly calculate the mode. So if alpha is greater than one and beta is greater than one, the mode is the interior of zero to one and equals alpha minus one over alpha plus beta minus two. So it's the one of the weird times where like the, and it's really close if you see it to this, where you have a mode very, relatively close to the mean. Uh, so how we actually calculate them, uh, once again, you have given alpha and you have given beta and you plug it into the function. So you have probability in this case from 0.7 to 0.1 or 1. Probability that simply proportion exceeds 0.7. So that's your lower bound to your upper bound. Gamma alpha plus beta, gamma alpha times gamma beta. Or that's the formula. So you have 3.5, which is our... Uh, 2.5 plus 1 times 2.5 times 1 from x to the 1.5 to the derivative of x. So 2.5 times 1.5 times 0.5 times pi over 1.5 times 0.5 times the square, or sorry, square root of pi to the pi times x squared 2.5 over 2.5. <clears throat> and all that breaks down into being 1 minus 0.7 to the 2.5 or 0.59. And we're done. Now, excuse me as I stop the.